אפשר להתחיל? אוקיי. אז באמת באנגלית? כן? אוקיי. אוקיי. So first of all I want to know who you are. So just briefly tell me what you are studying because I have to somehow tune myself to your background. What? East of Asia. East of Asia. Wow. That I knew there. Okay. So first of all, you have to realize that I didn't even know what's the name of your course because I wrote here uh, milestones for some reasons are not uh, of Napin cornerstone. Yeah. Yeah. You better turn off the light somewhere. Can? Is there a speak? Benatayim, is there a speak? Atem oim? Okay. So, um, I think basically it's impossible to, give, to, to tell you what I'm supposed to tell you. So I'll try to do it in a simple way and uh, I hope I will be somehow successful. Um, okay, so I base uh, this uh, presentation to you uh, on a meeting that I organized about uh, two or two months ago, an international meeting which was called Brain Repair. And uh, what I will try to, to uh, tell you today is uh, to give you one message. Basically there is one important message in what I'm going to say. And the important message is that uh, neurons or cells in the body are not uh, like buildings uh, uh, or uh, anything that was made from silicon, transistors, computers, etc. because they are continuously repairing themselves and continu continuously um, uh, fixing damages and making sure that everything is fresh and young until we get old and we can't do it anymore. Sorry. And, yeah? Who you are? Oh, my name is Micha. It's not important. At the end of the talk, if you still want to know who I am, I will tell you. But my name is Micha Spira and I'm a neurobiologist. Okay, so we are now equal in terms of uh, presenting uh, each other. I am interested uh, also in other things, so not only in neuroscience. So there is a constitutive maintenance of cells in the body and constitutive man maintenance of neurons. And this will be the main point. And this constitutive maintenance uh, enable us, uh, enable the cells to uh, repair themselves and also to cope with uh, a crisis situation, and I will explain later on what I mean, crisis situation. This is what goes wrong, basically, in neurodegenerative diseases, the ability to simply maintain the normal structure and function of the neurons. So what I'm going to talk about is the normal maintenance and then how neurons can cope with crisis situation, like mechanical injury or like disease, and then finally, because we are doing very poorly on those subjects, uh, we are starting to develop, and I'm <coughs> interested in all those subjects at the research level, we're starting to develop a, a <coughs> something that was not designed by the evolution, and that is to link machine and the brain, or interface electronics with neurons. And uh, to each one of those subjects, I've personally contributed, so I think that I will be able to tell you about it. So, constitutive maintenance or dynamic steady state, what, what is it? So, you should think about cells or neurons 
as a city, a complex city or a complex state or a complex uh, universe, if you want. And as uh, you can imagine, um, I don't have my mouse. I didn't bring my mouse here, so I will come over there. So you think about it like an office. And uh, a problem uh, with such an office is if you're not maintaining it in order, with discipline, it will not operate. This is related to our discussion on the way here. So the office has to be uh, clean, has to be maintained, the equipment has to work, communication has to flow, and so on. An office collects garbage, just like cells. Cells collect garbage. They have to be able to get rid of the garbage, just like an office or a city. So in order to get rid of the garbage, they have to have uh, decision makers to allocate manpower to get disposed of the uh, garbage. They have to have energy, they have to have cars, they have to have roads, they have to have a way to dispose of the garbage in a garbage uh, dump. And uh, then they have to fix the constitutive damage. Even if you don't have a crisis, no earthquake, no tsunami, no nothing, Something, someone has to take care of the situation. So, one has to clean the floor, one has to clean the cell. One has have to have uh, machines to get rid of the uh, garbage. The cell has to have machines, molecular motors, railroads, etc., to get rid. If not, the garbage collects and everything goes away and the cell is not functioning. You have to have someone to repaint, refix everything, and you have to have those decision makers that have to decide where, how the cell is going to allocate resources to the right place at the right time, and neurons in particular are very long, as you know, uh, have very long axons, so that they are far away from the cell body in which all the proteins, or most of them, are translated, they have to have a decision how, where and how to allocate these uh, resources. And if not, then this is what will happen. Okay. I want to show to you some examples to those statements. Okay, I mean, what do I mean by saying that you have to, that we have a maintenance or steady state situation in which, by which, we can repair the cells. You can stop me and ask me a question. So I uh, am going to give you examples from experiments that were done on neurons isolated from this creature. Do you know this creature? Have you seen it before? It's a snail. It's a marine mollusk. It's called the plesia, or in Hebrew, navon yam, sea hare in English. And it is called the plesia or sea hair because of uh, these two things that are sticking from the head. These are not ears, these are sensory organs uh, that are not uh, for uh, hearing. And this, uh, I don't know, I like it, so this nice mollusk uh, is uh, very famous in uh, neurobiology because Eric Kandel, that uh, has received this Nobel Prize for the study of uh, the biophysics and molecular biology of learning and memory, did his entire work on aplysia, on this uh, sea slug. And he got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, and if you are reading uh, cell, uh, neurobiology, you are reading from his book, Principles in Neuroscience. This is a big, thick book, uh, which covers really is a nice uh, textbook. So this is aplysia, and it doesn't have, of course, brain like mammals, but he has, it has small ganglia uh, which can be used. This is another view of uh, an aplysia, so you can understand why it is called a sea hair. Okay, this is a neuron isolated from the ganglion of aplysia, and this would explain to you why Eric Kandel selected, by the way, Aplysia can learn, remember, uh, for a short time, long time, whatever. Uh, and I'm not going to touch upon those subjects. I'm going to talk about cell biology of these neurons. So this is a Aplysia neuron. For neurobiologists, 
this slide is made for neurobiologists and you see that there is no calibration of the size. And the reason is because I like to surprise people uh, when I'm telling them that this is a one millimeter. So it's a very long neuron that can be cultured in a dish. This is the cell body, the axon, and those are neurites that are extending in culture. These cultured neurons can form synapses and the uh, uh, pairs of such neurons have been used by Eric Kendall to study the biophysics and molecular biology of learning and uh, memory. Okay, so, oops. So the principle, the uh, issue that I'm going to talk about is the uh, business of housekeeping or dynamic steady state that I've talked about. And I want to uh, start by discussing the surface area of a, a neuron, the plasma membrane. You have heard about it in earlier studies, so you know that each cell, all cells have a plasma membrane that isolate the interior of the cell from the uh, surrounding. And this plasma membrane is, of course, extremely important, otherwise there is no existence to a cell. So all the genetic machinery is located in the cell body, and everything is encapsulated or in, is, is surrounded by the plasma membrane. Now, this plasma membrane is like our skin, if you want, it has to be maintained. It contains all the, the channels, the ion channels that you heard about, receptors uh, that are embedded in the plasma membrane. But the cells do not have a plasma membrane that was formed once when the cell was growing. This plasma membrane turns over again and again and again and again to keep it fresh, to keep it good, to keep it healthy. Give me a number. What do you think is the rate by which this plasma membrane is turning over? Just a guess. Any idea? What do you think? I mean, you're made from those things. So you're here for about 100 years. Maybe you will be even longer. So how fast do you think the plasma membrane of your cells in your body is turning over? OK. So here we have a, a, an order of magnitude once a day. So there are cells in our body, not neurons, that turn over the entire surface area of a cell once every hour. Neurons in aplysia, I've measured it and I will show you how we have measured it, turn over once every about uh, 15 hours. Ask me how fast the membrane of our brains, which is supposed to maintain things, you know, memories and so on and so of are turning over, I cannot tell you because there are no good measurements. But it's somewhere, if I'm guessing right, somewhere in the order of hours, not more than that. And that assures that the plasma membrane, this outside uh, aspect of the cell, is being uh, refreshed continuously. It's like going to the uh, plastic surgeon once every day to have a, a lift up, a face lifted. So how, do, how can we measure the rate by which uh, the plasma membrane is turning over. The fact that uh, I'm telling you that the plasma membrane is turning over implies basically that uh, somehow uh, there is a machinery to take part of the plasma membrane and internalize it, and there is a machinery which enables the cell to put new membrane into the surface area, otherwise the surface area will change. And if we are talking about neurons, changes, large changes in the surface area would imply that the cell is not maintaining its structure. And if the cell is not maintaining its structure, I know that you don't know it, but the electroanatomical properties of the cells are altered, and thus it will not be the same functionally. So basically the mechanism, let's see if we have a something to write on the blackboard. No. 
There is something? You're working, this is private or university stuff? <laughs> so the basic mechanisms are as follows. So let's assume that this is a, a cell and it can take away part of the plasma membrane, retrieve plasma membrane by a mechanism which is called endocytosis and this is how it looks. So the cell is able to sort of uh, uh, um, retrieve a plasma membrane and this is done with uh, some element of the cytoskeleton that are generating the mechanical force and then this vesicle is internalized. So the surface area is reduced by this amount of membrane. These are small vesicles of about, let's say, uh, 100 nanometers in, uh, in diameter. There is a, another mechanism which, is, which you are familiar with, and this is uh, exocytosis. So you have vesicles that can fuse with the plasma membrane. So here is the vesicles, and then by some rather complex mechanism, it can link or bind to the plasma membrane and then fuse with it, and then this structure collapses and uh, it, becomes, it becomes part of the membrane. So this is fusion, addition of plasma membrane, and this is retrieval. And this is called recycling of the plasma membrane, and this is what I was talking about. So there is continuous recycling, now I'm using the proper terminology, of the plasma membrane. And this can be so rapid that a cell can recycle its entire surface area once every hour. Okay, so how do we know that? This is the mechanism by which a plasma membrane is generated in the cell. I think that you know about it. You heard about the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum. So vesicles are generated by the Golgi apparatus and then they are shipped. And we will talk a little bit about it along the axon and somewhere they fuse with the plasma membrane and thereby they add surface area to the plasma membrane, and vesicles are also retrieved, endocytosed, and shipped back to the cell body for repair, and, and they, uh, thereby the plasma membrane surface area is reduced. If I can block the Golgi apparatus, if I can design a drug which will demolish, somehow break down the Golgi apparatus, then, and the cell will not know about it, then it will continue to retrieve membrane, and what should happen? If there is no supply of new membrane, and the membrane is continuously being retrieved, what will happen? The surface area will be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And here is an experiment that was done by one of my students to address this question, what will happen when we block the Golgi apparatus? And here is a neuron, cultured aplysia neuron, and now you have even the calibration. This is 100 micrometers, so this is a millimeter long by far, more than a millimeter long axon. Look what happens. We block the Golgi apparatus, we block the source of vesicles to the plasma membrane, and the, the, the axon is shrinking until this neuron is becoming like a neuroblast, a rounded cell. And all this we can measure, right? And calculate the surface area, and we know the time. This is within 48 hours, that what you see here. <coughs> and it implies that if you block the source of the plasma membrane, then you get shrinkage because you have constitutive endocytosis. Okay, this is just for, yes? I have a sure. Uh, the body apparatus is quite uh, robust and the uh, channel block, I don't say. Yes. Uh, how do you know that uh, your uh, uh, suggestion is a secondary business to other things, right? There are other mechanisms by which we can block uh, uh, the. Uh, generation of new membrane, and they also operate. So it's not 
uh, just one type of experiment uh, that, that is doing it. Just to uh, remind you, I don't know if you can see it well, uh, this is how the Golgi apparatus looks like uh, in uh, electron micrographs. So these are the, the stacks of membrane that compose the Golgi apparatus. This is what happens when you uh, uh, destroy it with a certain drug. And this is the, the outcome is then the disappearance of uh, all the axon and its branching uh, neurites. What happened then if you, under these conditions, recover the Golgi apparatus? So can you guess what will happen when now you allow the Golgi apparatus to recover in terms of the shape of the neuron? It will grow back because the retrieval of the plasma membrane is proportional to the surface area. If the, sur if the Golgi apparatus remembers its original dimension and will produce the amount of vesicles to uh, support the normal size of the cell, but now the surface area is reduced, then it means that more vesicles will be produced, more vesicles will fuse then the amount of vesicles that are retrieved. So it's a simple relation and this is what happens. So you see, this is the cell that uh, was generated after the elimination, the shrinkage of the axon, and then you just let it go and it will start growing. It grows in a different way because all the external cues that direct the pattern of growth are, are absent under these conditions, but it will regrow the surface area. And from measurement of this kind of experiments, one can conclude indeed that neurons, and to be very precise, cultured aplysian neurons recycle the plasma membrane once every about 15 hours. I cannot give you the number of mammals, but I expect them to be uh, well in this uh, range. Uh, we can see, using confocal microscopy, did you hear about confocal microscope? Huh. It's not dual focus. No, I will not tell you what confocal microscope. I'm just telling you this is not the images that I will be showing to you are not generated by conventional uh, microscope, but a special microscope and special um, methods. I don't think that we should go into that. Just remember that this is not just light microscopy. I'm not sure that this. Uh, I don't see the. Okay. I'm not sure that this is the movie. No. Okay. I will show you later on confocal images. I just wanted to show you here what is endocytosis or what endocytosis looks like in the real, uh, in electron micrographs. And here you can see that the plasma membrane is sort of forming this half uh, 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 vesicle with a neck that is connected still with the external fluid, as you can see here, and then with the help of cytoskeletal elements, of like muscle element in the cell, in the neurons, then it uh, can form this vesicle, and this vesicle then is transported, and I will show you how those vesicles are being uh, transported later on. Okay, so this, let me just say the sentence, and you can ask me, this is to prove to you the concept that although a neuron maintains a certain structure throughout the life after it differentiated and so on, the plasma membrane and other components, I'm just giving the plasma membrane as an example, are continuously recycling, continuously repairing themselves and when this process of repair is not maintained, then we are in trouble. Then there are changes in the morphology and the physiology of the neuron, and this leads to degeneration, neurodegeneration, and so on. I wonder how does the process begin in the cytosis? How does the, this particular part in the membrane all, all die? Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> That's a very good question. In uh, this type, so there are, again, this is just a, a very, a, an oversimplified explanation. There are many types of endocytosis, endocytotic processes. Some of them are generated, uh, not those that I'm talking about. Some of them, evolutionary, are generated to internalize food particles. So you can see endocytosis already in protozoa, single cell animals. And they, are, they have to feed on something. They usually feed on bacteria or things like that. And they have to internalize the bacteria into the cell. And the way that they can, and the bacteria cannot go through the plasma membrane, okay? So what the cells are doing are endocytoting those bacteria and they endocytose it because of a molecular recognition event that the bacteria generate in respect to the plasma membrane. So there are special receptors in the plasma membrane that can feel the presence of a bacterium. And this uh, interaction generates assembly of the machinery, which has to generate mechanical force. So it's the cytoskeletal elements. I don't know if you have heard about actin or not. There are names to all those uh, molecules. And, but there are other forms of uh, endocytosis, and some of them are just called pinocytosis, not endocytosis. And they are called pinocytosis to differentiate it and tell you that this is just not because of interaction be between a particle and the membrane. It's spontaneous. It's like drinking drinking of the extracellular fluid by the cell. And this is more like pinocytosis. It's, it, it is happening all over the cell, in the cell body, along the axon, and other parts of the cell as well. So, and this is not particular to, uh, to neuron, what I'm telling you. This is cell biology. This is happening uh, in any cell. And uh, many people are thinking of that as a way to even target the uh, cancer cell because they have uh, pinocytose faster than other cells. So it's a general phenomenon. But in terms of principle, remember that the, the, the reason that I'm talking about this plasma membrane is to give you just the feel that this is real, that there is, that you are turning, you, your cells are turning over all the time. And to turn over all the time properly, you have to eat well, you have to have enough oxygen, you have to have good blood circulation, you have to have all those things. But the, the, at the reductionist level of this discussion, each cell in your body, maybe not the uh, skin cells that are half dead, but the rest is turning over all the time. So you are not you, I think. By the time that I finish my presentation, many of the cells in your body will not be the same. So it's, it's amazing, basically. Yet, as an organism, we are the same, right? Okay. Okay. Now, there is another uh, aspect which I think is uh, very important, and it will link us uh, to regeneration and disease, and this is the trafficking of uh, the organelles and, let's say, the vesicles that I was, talk that I was talking about. So I was telling you that, that vesicles that are budding off from the Golgi apparatus are being carried along the, some machinery uh, from the cell body to their destination, one meter away from the cell bodies that I have in my spinal cord to the toe in the, in the leg. This is a long distance. There must be a machinery that uh, will take the goodies the stuff that are, is generated by the cell body and transport it uh, to, uh, to the tip. And it has to be organized, maybe like our transport system. Let's look what is the transport system composed of here. So we have the roads, the tracks, that have to be in good condition. And if the municipality is not taking good care of it, then there, is, there are problems. So it has to be repaired and maintained properly. We have to have energy to drive the machine. We have to have machines. We have to have a system which will link the cargo, us in this case, 
with the machine. And all this is happening in the cell using the same terminology. That's how we describe it. So we have the tracks, we have molecular motors, we have energy supply, we have cargo, and we have the cargo that is linked to the machine. Another important thing is that you see all those cars are pointing their plus end. The plus end is, I, I will call, this part of the, of the car. They're pointing their plus end in one direction. So somehow someone told them that there is a directionality. On this track, you can go only in this direction. The same thing is happening in the cell at the level, at the molecular level. So let me briefly uh, show you that aspect. So here you can see uh, the tracks on which the vesicles are being transported. The tracks are called microtubules. I don't know if you heard about microtubules. You did? OK, so these are the microtubules. And the microtubules have polarity. There is a plus end and a minus end to the microtubules. And the molecular motors that carry different vesicles can recognize the polar orientation of the road, of the microtubules, so that you have some vesicles that, let's say, are endocytos, that are going retrogradely. Retrograde is from the tip to where the cell body, and some are going anterogradely using different molecular motors. So it's like the clutch in a car. OK. And this is how a microtubule look like. The microtubules also obey the laws of dynamic steady state or dynamic instability. They are, again, a structure that is made of proteins. It's not different in principle from the uh, plasma membrane. Microtubules that are polymers, actually, that are made from dimers, as that you can see here, are assembling continuously dimers at one end and are <coughs> losing dimers at the other end. So again, you have a machinery it looks like a waste of material and a waste of energy and a waste of time. But no, it is not a waste. It keeps everything in the cells operating like a baby. So the, the situation of this polymer should be always very good, unless something goes wrong and then we, are, we have a problem and we have a disease. OK, this is how the cargo and things are moving in, uh, real, uh, in real life, of course. So here is the microtubule made of dimers. This is the molecular motor. And the me molecular motor can read continuously the polar orientation of the microtubules. This one goes from, let's say, minus to the plus. There is a linker between the molecular motor and the cargo. And the cargo is being carried on and is dumped wherever it should be uh, dumped. <laughs> OK, so with uh, these two tools that I've described to you, vesicles, membrane, and the microtubules and the motors, I'm going to now move to not steady state maintenance, but show you how these elements are being used to deal with a crisis. And the crisis that I'm going to describe to you is exotomy. And that is that when, when you cut an axon, it can sense the event it can do many things, and it can regrow. So what zones the direction of the tractors? Is it the orientation? What yeah, so the, the, what the, all the microtubules in an axon, let's say, are pointing uh, in one direction. There are many microtubules, uh, and they point, if here is the cell body, And this is the tip of the axon, the synapses, etc. So all microtubules in an axon point their plus end in one direction. And there are two families, basically. There are more than two. But roughly, there are two families of molecular motors. A family that can read. And each one of those microtubules is composed of dimers. And dimers it means two parts. The, the dimers. And the dimers are made of two non-identical parts. 
alpha and beta, they are called. And the steps of the motor that I just uh, showed you can recognize the alpha and beta. And they can walk only from alpha to beta to alpha to beta to alpha to beta. And these motors will serve anthrograde transport. There is a different, a second family of, of molecular motors that walks from in the opposite direction. So this is what determines the polar uh, mobility or <coughs> yeah, polar distribution of the organelles, vesicles, mitochondria, everything is moving. Mitochondria that you've learned about are not sitting in one place. The mitochondria are also moving and they concentrate in some sites that are, uh, uh, they need uh, ATP, but usually they move also along this uh, railroad. So let me just uh, describe to you the situation of a cell of an axon that is being transected. And I'm talking about an uh, axon of the peripheral nerve. You know very well that central nerve system, if you have injury of the central nerve system, so far we cannot uh, correct it. So people remain uh, paralyzed by such events. But the peripheral nerve system uh, is capable of regeneration. But if you think about it, and I don't know how fast you are. Usually I finish to read what is on the slide when the guy that is talking is yucking. And if you are like me, then, then you went through this list already. But the main point here is that you have to understand that the cell, a single cell, a little thing, has to make a lot of uh, uh, decisions and a lot of actions in order to be able to regenerate. It has to know that it was transected. So the signal that is uh, generated at the site of transection somehow has to be delivered to the cell body. The cell body has to turn on some genes in order to provide supply that will enable the cell to regrow. This is the uh, classical view of regeneration. I don't think that this is right, but I I'm teaching you now what is written in textbooks. So it has to recruit energy, resources, material, vesicles, everything, <laughs> and send it to the site of uh, injury, and then to uh, assemble a machinery that will enable this uh, material to be utilized in order to uh, regenerate. Then it has to recognize the target and form new synapse, etc. Okay, so I want to show you that that it is not a, a waste. Uh, oops, sorry. That it is not a waste uh, to have all this uh, uh, dynamic steady state situation. This is the kind of experiment that I'm going to describe to you now. So we have a culture that plays your neurons. We cut it, imitating the situation of uh, injury. A and we have this part. I will not talk about that part. This part normally degenerates. I'll talk about this part. And if you look at it with the microscope, regular microscope, you'll see that the tip of the cut axon uh, sorry, the, the tip of the cut axon is uh, generating a special uh, structure and that you can see here, it is called the growth cone. It's a special compartment which uh, is able to utilize the material that is generated by the cell body uh, for regrowth uh, processes. And then the material is used and you can see that the tip is branching up and starting to extend like this. And uh, then the tips of those uh, growing neurites can form synapses. So of course, I'm not, uh, I, I will not be able to tell you all the mechanisms that underlie the regeneration. I just want us to uh, relate mainly to uh, to some of them, and the here, here, here is one. So when we cut an axon, 
the first thing that happens, I don't see the, OK, here it is. Uh, so when we cut an axon, the, the first thing that happens is that calcium ions go in through the cut end. Now, I don't know if you heard about calcium ion. Calcium ion is, is a very interesting subject in uh, biology because uh, they are very important in normal function of uh, neurons, but they're also very, uh, very, very dangerous because ca excess calcium in neurons can lead to degeneration. So if you cut an axon, and you'll see it being cut here, the free intracellular calcium concentration is elevated. And this is the first signal to the cell to start uh, uh, constructing the machinery for regeneration. But I'm showing you this uh, image just to tell you that you can do amazing things at, at the level of cell, the cell biological level of imaging many things. I'm going to leave now the calcium and I'm going to go back to vesicles and, and the cytoskeleton. So, what I'm going to show you is basically this, that in normal axon, your axon and aplasia axon, all the microtubules point the plus end in one direction. This defines the traffic of vesicles, normal traffic of vesicles. So some vesicles will go anthrogradely. These are the blue ones that you see up there. And some will go retrogradely. Those are the red ones. It's, they simply use different uh, molecular motors. When we cut an axon, because we rupture the plasma membrane, calcium goes into the axon. As a result of the influx of calcium, the microtubules undergo depolymerization. This is, they fall apart because of some enzyme that are enzymes that are activated because of the elevation in the free intracellular calcium concentration. But then the cell can close the membrane, the ruptured membrane, spontaneously. As soon as it closes the plasma membrane, mechanisms that normally regulate the free intracellular calcium concentration downregulate the calcium concentration, and the microtubules repolymerize again. But look how smart the cell is. It does not depolymer repolymerize the microtubules in the same way, like that but it causes some of the microtubules to reverse their polar orientation. And this causes traps. This is a fantastic scheme, right? I'm telling you like an engineer designed that. But this is happening automatically in an axon that didn't know a second before that it's going to be cut. It, in fact, did not know the, in the evolution that it's going to be cut, right? But somehow, it, is able, it can reverse the polar orientation of the microtubule and form traps of vesicles because of the polar orientation of the microtubules. You remember now that vesicles that go in one direction, when they reach this point, they cannot continue, right? Because they don't know how to walk on, on microtubules in the opposite way. Or it's like saying one-way road, stop here. And they all are stuck here because they are not able to return. So it's like a stupid organization of the municipality that last night changed the instruction on how, how to drive. But this is not. This is very smart. Because of the concentration of vesicles here, they can fuse with the plasma membrane, remember? And since they, their concentration here is so high, they fuse in excess of the endocytosis. And when they fuse in excess of the endocytosis, the outcome is growth in this location. How do I know that? This is a nice story. If you know the word chizbat, this may be also a chizbat, right? A bluff. OK, so how do we know that? Mm. So this is how we know this kind of thing. <coughs> Yeah, uh, Mona was telling you a lot about molecular biology and about molecules. This is how microtubules normally um, uh, polymerize. So it adds in the plus end uh, dimers like that. But what we have done was to take a human gene, a human protein, that can be tag tagged with a fluorescent molecule. 
It is called GFP. I don't know if you heard about it or not, but this is a very fancy method. It's not, it's being used for the last 10 years uh, by cell biologists. You can take a, a, a protein and tag it with uh, a light bulb with certain color, okay? And there, you can visualize the pr presence of this protein inside the cell, okay? So everything is, you don't see anything, but the proteins that you have tagged with a certain color can be seen. This is done with confocal micro microscope. And so if we tag this protein, it is called plus N binding protein, it simply binds we're along the tip of the polymerizing microtubules, but only along the tip of the polymerizing microtubules. So what do you expect me to see if I look at the microscope on those microtubules? What image do you think I will see? Dots. Dots? There is a better uh, way to describe it. Now, I need someone from... Tails. Yeah? Tails, like comet tails, exactly. We should see comet tails, right? We can almost write a poem on this. And here are the comet tails that we can see using this, uh, this method. So this is the cell body. This is the axon. This is a special area that is called microtubule organizing center. Uh, yeah, I want for a minute so that you can see it better. This is, this is a cell. This is a, a cell body with the tip of microtubules in the cell body. And you can already, because you are expert now, you can say that the microtubule in the cell body point in various directions. But in the axon, they point in one direction, as I told you earlier. I will... Uh, switch between dark and light because uh, I want to make sure that you are not going to fall asleep. So this is the axon now. Oh, no, it's not this one. So this is the axon. You can see that the microtubules, almost all of them <coughs> pointing in one direction. This is the normal axon. So remember, you have the microtubules. The tip of the microtubules, the plus N, is labeled by a molecular biological trick. And using confocal microscope, you can see the microtubules polarizing in one direction. And this is axonal transaction. So I'm going to turn off the light again. And I hope that I placed it. Look what happened. Wait. We will wait for the starting of this movie. OK, so you see all the microtubules point in one direction. Now we, um, we cut the axon. You can see that they depolymerize. You can see that they are uh, uh, repolymerizing, forming here a trap of reversed polar orientation. So here is, a, an, I think, the best movie that I have generated, or my students have generated. And you can see that uh, the polar orientation and the trap that is formed here. And the reason that I'm saying that there is a trap, because we can label the vesicles with red color so we can look at the vesicles, how they behave. You can see them being trapped here in this location. And in confocal microscopy, it's a computerized system. You can, you can sort of overlap the microtubule image with the vesicle image. And you can see the trapping of vesicles here at this location. So we have, we, we have here a situation where, and this is the point that I wanted to make, where as a consequence of the fact that the microtubules 
can change their polar orientation and they are normally in a state of dynamic instability and the fact that vesicles can, be, can recycle all the time, the two of them together are taken by the cell to be able to respond to a crisis situation and generate a, a recovery a, of uh, the situation. Just to be sure that you are not going to miss uh, this point, vesicles are transported. Oops, I'm sorry. I want to show you uh, the previous. Yeah, this one. Uh, vesicles are transported along the microtubules like that. So this is not a dream that I'm talking about, but we can really see that, that transport, retrograde transport of vesicles. The recovery of uh, an axon uh, from injury can be documented also by looking at other proteins uh, in the cell body. And you can see here actin, which uh, is uh, assembled here at the cut end, and microtubules that are extending here. And everything is possible really only because of the fast turnover rate of those proteins um, um, in, in the normal condition of the cell. Asmanim? It's a time of about a or three It's quite fast. The, the growth <coughs> is quite fast. And here you can see it's highly organized. It's, it's like very nicely orchestrated. The cell has the ability to put the actin in the periphery, to extend the microtubules in the center. And these are the bases, the, the real cell biological bases to enable regeneration, regrowth of uh, neurons after uh, axonal uh, injury. OK. So this was an unexpected event with which the cell could cope because of the dynamic uh, steady state in which it is uh, present. Now I want to switch to neurodegeneration. And we now believe that neuro neurodegenerative diseases, I mean, human neurodegenerative diseases, we believe that all the, these diseases, including Alzheimer and the other stuff that you have probably have heard from Mona and from Haggai and other speakers that you had here, are due to traffic jams. I told you at the beginning of my presentation, think about a cell like a city. It's like Jerusalem at early at 8 o'clock in the morning where no car can move or it takes hours and hours until the car starts moving because of uh, traffic jams or New York is more uh, a better example than Jerusalem. Uh, and I want to show you one case to, to sort of sh demonstrate to you that mismatching of the microtubules in a cell, in an adult cell, can cause degeneration due to traffic jams. And this is, uh, again, was done on aplysia. Uh, and it is a, a, a set of experiments which imitate a conditions of a, a type of Alzheimer disease, not because the beta amyloid plaques that you heard about, but because of a tau, uh, which is a microtubule associated protein. I don't know if you heard about tau. So I'm going to show you experiments in which we inject human tau, mutated human tau, into cultured aplysia neurons. And the a, a, a mutated human tau uh, that we inject here is an underlying cause of for tauopathy or type of Alzheimer. Uh, which is uh, fami familial. So it's a genetically uh, induced uh, pathology, not environmental. 
Uh, I think that we will be able to also uh, get to the environmental uh, aspect of this. So let's see how it looks. You remember that normally uh, this is how a city should uh, operate with a clean road, traffic that goes to the right direction without any problems. And my message to you is that traffic jams is the, con is the reason for degeneration. Obviously, a city cannot operate within, under such conditions, and a cell cannot operate under such conditions. Okay. And what I will show you is the following. That this gene is causing a change in the polar orientation of microtubules to, to form what I call polar mismatching. You can see that the microtubules point in various directions here. And as a consequence, vesicles are trapped in various directions along the uh, fibers. And this was done again with confocal imaging. So this is already what you know. This is the normal way that microtubules are oriented. And normally, vesicles, can you see that? No? So vesicles are normally transported along the microtubules. In this case, it's retrograde transport. You can see that the microtubules are going in this way and the vesicles are going in that way. But it's highly organized. And the cell is just maintaining uh, that kind of uh, uh, behavior. OK. So now, what happens when we inject uh, to the cell mutant tau? So this is what is happening. Within uh, quite a short time, we can see hot spots of tau. This is in the axon. Normally, they never appear in the axon like that. But because tau, as you know, is a microtubule stabilizing molecule, it somehow generates this kind of configuration of a hot spot of microtubules in the axon. But what, you, what you can see is that at this point, the microtubules radiate in all directions. What do you expect the consequences to be under such conditions? Slowing of the transport of vesicles. Exactly. And this is, what, uh, this is what we see. So here is another experiment in which we label the vesicles. Oops, sorry. In which we label the vesicles, and, uh, uh, and you can see that the, the vesicles are blocked at this point. Uh, and this is the beginning of Alzheimer's disease because we also did electrophysiological experiments, which I'm going to, not going to elaborate or to tell you about. But this leads to, of course, failure of synaptic transmission because you don't have supply of vesicle. Okay. And as a consequence of these traffic jams, in human beings, this is what we see. So this is, a, 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 this is the accumulation of all kinds of organelles that cannot be transported in the, uh, in the neurites of humans. This is, of course, post-mortem of a, a, an Alzheimer's disease patient. And exactly similar uh, outcome is seen in uh, cultured aplysia uh, neurons. I have a problem here with, OK. So the way that we are, or the, 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 the principles that I've shown you are the cell biological principles of uh, normal cells, of how they uh, can recover from injury, and uh, that they are also playing in neurodegenerative diseases. The main point is, of course, the turnover uh, of uh, molecules, of plasma membrane, of microtubules, and of course, other, all proteins have certain half lifetimes. Some of them turn over fast, 
Some of them turns over slow, but they are all turning over. And this is a base, the basis, the cell biological basis for the diseases. And in the future, it will be also the basis for uh, recovery. But we are failing, basically. You know that millions of dollars have been spent on uh, finding cures to Alzheimer's disease or to injury of the central nerve system, and nothing really works. So a large group, not a large group, a small group of neurobiologists and engineers have decided to try and find other approaches to fix damaged nerve system. And I'm very happy that I had an unexpected, a con very large contribution to the field. I'm not going to tell you about what I'm doing, but on what other people are doing in this uh, field. And uh, this led basically to try and replace damaged organs uh, by machines, like uh, artificial uh, hands, and uh, this uh, in by cochlear implants. And you know that cochlear implants are operating surprisingly well. People that cannot hear after uh, getting this implant are uh, hearing quite well. Uh, the uh, artificial hands are engineered in a very smart way, and they can be, and they can even operate quite well. The main, and engineering uh, such an artificial arm is not a big deal any, any longer with the technology that is available. The biggest problem is, of course, to link between two entities that were generated on different time scales by different personalities, I don't see, uh, 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 by different entities, let's say, evolution or God and mankind. And this is to link silicon, the silicon world, with uh, uh, live material. The link between silicon and uh, and uh, life matter is not trivial. You know that silicon was totally rejected uh, by evolution. There is, we, don't, we, we don't contain any silicon. Silicon is used only for one medical purpose, and this is uh, uh, not a serious uh, uh, way to use silicon. So the linkage, the interface between electronics and live material is a problem. In the case of uh, artificial arms, the people that are uh, producing it uh, have developed a way to record electromyograms. So they record um, action potentials generated by muscles. What they do is to, in an amputee, to take a piece of uh, muscle and denervate it, allow the motor neurons to grow to this piece of muscle, and then they, with electrodes, pick up activity, and then with machine learning, they have to direct the action potentials to different parts of the uh, 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 artificial arm. And this worked pretty well. It's not good enough, but it is possible to, to do it. And we are involved, many groups are now involved in trying to find better ways to overcome uh, this uh, problem. The dream to generate uh, an artificial eye is, of course, uh, part of science fiction, but it's not science fiction anymore. There are a number of companies already that are doing uh, retinal implants. Uh, and that is to say that they, uh, <coughs> they uh, use a camera, a video camera, that is then, then uh, projecting the images uh, into uh, the eye, which contain a retinal implant, which is uh, basically a, a, an array of microelectrodes that is uh, picking up uh, the activity of the neurons in the retina and are uh, transmitting it uh, to the central nerve system. The, the, the implant is in the retina. And the camera? The camera is sitting on the eyeglasses of the person. 
So it's a small, very small video camera uh, that cannot be, I mean, you don't see it when, when uh, you look at uh, such eyeglasses, so-called so eyeglasses, and then uh, through some uh, optics, uh, it's uh, deflected, the, the image is deflected to, uh, to the retinal implant. And it's uh, even not connected uh, to the outside world, charging of uh, power sources for those uh, implants is, by, uh, is, is done by external uh, devices. And there are some experiments, uh, Second Sight, there is a big company which is called Second Sight that is now uh, already in clinical uh, trials and blind people uh, are uh, delighted with this. They don't see much, I mean, they see very blurly, but they still have the sensation of, be of being able to, to see uh, something. So this is another uh, way. The retinal implants, there are many types of retinal implants, but uh, just to give you a feeling, uh, this is uh, some images from part of the retinal implants, and in this case, it's the guy from Stanford. Uh, you can see the implants uh, in relation to the tissue of the retina. The retina is highly organized uh, tissue with uh, photoreceptors here and uh, ganglion cells, nerve cells that are on the uh, uh, layer that is facing the world, basically, and then fibers that are leading uh, to the brain. But instead of uh, using those fibers, the uh, retinal implant is picking up the, uh, the signals uh, from uh, the retina. And uh, the tissue is really re responding quite nicely uh, to the presence of uh, artificial uh, structures in the retina and in fact cells that are part of the retina are growing into cavities that are generate that are formed in the retinal implant and the integration in terms of the histology is uh, pretty good a an amazing field in this uh, respect is a field in which electrodes are being tr transplanted into the cortex and uh, it uh, is working surprisingly uh, well. So there is one paper from, and it was published in Nature in 2006, and there are since then many more, uh, in which a, a person that is tetraplegic uh, could uh, learn uh, to move a cursor on a computer screen uh, with such uh, an implant. The person, this person was paralyzed for over four years. Then he received this implant, which uh, is shown here. The implant is in the size of a cent. This is the implant in respect to a cent. And there are about 100 electrodes sticking out from uh, this uh, chip. And uh, it was implanted into the cortex of this person who uh, has learned to move a cursor on a computer screen. The problem with those implants is that the uh, signal that is uh, picked up by the electrode is extremely small, and sometimes it's very close to the noise level of the machine. And the problems are still very large because, first of all, this, the signal the signal-to-noise ratio is not good. And then, with time, uh, other, you know that our brain does not contain only neurons, but also contain uh, glia cells. And there is competition between the glia cells and the uh, neurons on the, uh, uh, on, on, in ad adhering to this, these electrodes. Basically, glia cells tend to, sur to surround uh, any object, foreign object that is inserted to, to the brain. And these glia cells then isolate 
the device from the neurons. And one of the problem is to try and uh, prevent uh, glia cells from growing uh, toward uh, uh, the electrode. So, so right now, there are uh, devices uh, which are being tested in, in human beings, but there are many experiments that, were that are being done on uh, animals, and uh, I don't know if you know it, but uh, one can teach monkeys to move a robotic arm uh, in any desired uh, direction. Uh, one can teach a, a monkey, uh, which is implanted with similar electrodes to what I've shown you, to feed itself or himself by picking up food and placing it in the mouth uh, with a robotic arm, not with his own arm. His, his, uh, the the uh, arm are being confined uh, to his body. And uh, so this is another way uh, that I see uh, to repair uh, or to replace and repair and the central nerve system replace, I mean, sensory organs like the ear, the eyes, possibly smell, and uh, to even link between parts that were disconnected in the spinal cord. Uh, and this part of uh, the repair has nothing to do with, uh, of course, constitutive uh, replacement of parts of the of the neurons, this is really linking between the creation of God and creation of man. And I think I will stop here. Okay, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask. So, so the damage that uh, is being dealt with now is uh, retinal damage, not uh, CNS damage. So if the retina is uh, not operating, but uh, then, then it can be, uh, this, is, this is the approach, not to replace visual cortex, which I think can be done. This, this I don't think is a big problem, because I think that one can use other part of the cortex to generate sensations and I don't know I think that for people that were born uh, uh, blind uh, but their cortex is uh, operating uh, can can sense vision yeah and how about people that's, that, this is the, the main uh, uh, group of people that uh, these devices are generated for, macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, what about neurodegenerative diseases when it comes to uh, these kinds of projects? Because uh, the engineering. So, so I, <sighs> engineering this approach I think it's obviously it may be useful to replace lost parts or to link lost parts. But if uh, cognition, for example, is, uh, is uh, damaged because of neurodegeneration, I don't think at this point of time that uh, we can use computers to replace part of the cognitive uh, aspects of our uh, brain. But it, it's amazing what one can do with those things. I was uh, uh, presenting my work in this field uh, two weeks ago in Padova, in Italy, and there was a company based in Austria that came with gadgets that are amazing. In 10 minutes, uh, a student, uh, and I'm, this is not a sexist uh, uh, comment on my, on my side, you'll understand why I'm saying a, a, a student, a woman a student, uh, learned within uh, 10 minutes how to write letters on screen without saying a word and without anything uh, using a machine that they have uh, designed. 
So what they've designed is an EEG, electroencephalogram machine, that uh, fits on the head. And uh, the, point of the, the point that I made is that uh, this was a woman because she had big, a lot of hair, uh, beautiful hair. And one of the problems uh, that, uh, that they had to solve is to make good contact without taking the hair off. And they have solved the problem uh, so, so that you could put this uh, hat on your hair and with some uh, material, they get very good contact with the skin without harming the skin. And they pick up the EEG, then they display to this uh, uh, student a matrix of letters and light was running across this matrix. And the EEG that is generated by the light, when she recognized the letter that she picked up, the EEG signal was changed a little bit. But it was enough for the computer system, and it's a very elaborate uh, 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 way to process the information. The computer system could recognize that she means this word because the shape of the EEG generated by these light flashes was changed. And, and so she could, within five seconds, pick a letter and place it on the screen. And she, in, in 10 minutes, could write a whole sentence. I mean, after <coughs> practicing 10 minutes to do that, she could write sentences. It's amazing. And I think this may uh, affect many, uh, the life of many people that are in a, what is called locked-in syndrome. So people that are in a situation in which the observer from the outside think that they are not responding, that they are unable to think, that they are unable to re really express their wishes, uh, can maybe, many of them, a fraction of them, can use such machines which are non-invasive and easy to be used uh, in no time. Uh, so I think that this uh, may have a fantastic uh, impact on on a very important part of the society that is taken as if they are, you know, finished. And it's not true. Now statistics show that about 30% of the people that are comatose, they are not. They can respond. If you give them a way to uh, express uh, their their thinking. So even with just um, a simple hat like configuration, uh, it can be already utilized. But I don't think that someone that has Alzheimer can benefit from such a thing. I didn't want to tell you about it, but there are ways now, at least uh, I believe that there are ways, fantastic ways, to slow down the, the progression of uh, theopathy, like uh, the one that I described to you, with drugs that are being used uh, in the clinics. I will just say it, for, for, and, and I will finish, that I've shown you that, uh, that the theopathy that is induced by injection of a human gene, mutated human gene of tau, to please the neurons, it causes um, reorientation of the microtubules, okay? And this causes traffic jams, and this causes degeneration. And the way that we thought we can prevent it is by stabilizing the microtubules. And there are many drugs that stabilize microtubules. And these drugs were developed for what, do you know? It's drugs that stabilize microtubules. No, but what, what, why did people develop drugs that block uh, or that stabilize microtubules? What, what is it good for? This, this is the main principle to deal with cancer. Ca divi cell division is generated by microtubule, uh, uh, by mechanisms that are related to the mechanics of the microtubules. In cell division, the microtubules change their polar orientation. And they are polymerizing. So we took a drug which is used in the clinics 
uh, mainly to treat women with breast cancer or ovarian cancer. It is called paclitaxel or taxol. This is the most uh, the, 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 the drug that is most used most extensively in the clinics. Uh, it, it is a problematic drug uh, because it causes pains and so on and so forth, but this is the drug. With concentration that are lower than the ones that are used in clinic, we could prevent the changes in the polar orientation of the microtubules induced by this uh, tau mutant. So there are ways, I think, uh, to start thinking of drugs that will prevent the, the um, development of, uh, of Alzheimer's. So far, it's a, a big failure with millions of dollars invested. So far, there is no one real drug that can handle any uh, neurodegenerative disease. The best uh, results are, as you heard from Haggai, uh, deep brain stimulation, which is pretty good. It's operating pretty good, but it has also many problems. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome.